Welcome, and thank you for joining us for this episode, Risk and Protective Factors. I'm Deborah Seltzer, and I'm again joined by Beth Malkus-Staffa and Dr. Sandra Ortega. We gave you a sprinkle into this topic in our last episode. In this episode, we dig deeper into how these concepts will improve our policies, programs, and practices choices. In this episode, there are three learning objectives seen on the slide. For those nerdy preventionists, our learning objectives are floating up to the top of the Bloom's Cognitive Pyramid. I guess this is where I groan at a bad health education joke. If you must. Beth, I really think you need to keep your day job. Okay, I thought it was funny. In this slide, you'll see three pillars or theories. Ohio's RPE prevention continues to be grounded in these three pillars. One, the social ecological model. Two, the nine principles of effective prevention programs. And three, risk and protective factors. For many of you, these will sound familiar because they are found in the SA IPV preventionist com competencies. If you're unfamiliar with the first two pillars, we've included resources to get you up to speed. The Ohio Alliance to End Sexual Violence is also available to provide technical assistance. In today's episode, we will offer a brief review of the risk and protective factors and how they help create an effective primary prevention plan. In the first episode, I spoke about connecting the dots. When it was published, I thought it was a preventionist dream. In my eyes, I felt CDC had finally provided us with something to grab onto. It identified the common risk and protective factors for each form of violence, and it gave us a visual in what I like to call the bingo chart. It identified which risk and protective factors we share with, say, bullying or dating violence, and it also showed it across the social ecological model. Up to this point, I felt we were randomly picking programs and strategies with hopes that we were making a change. This document was a game changer for choosing strategies or PPPs that would make an impact on these risk and protective factors. From an evaluator's point of view, it narrowed down what indicators we should be measuring and identifying different ways to measure to get a better picture of change. I think I was one of the original cheerleaders for connecting the dots because as Beth said, it really gave us a way to align our work and hone in on indicators we could all scaffold on to the principles of prevention. Everyone is familiar with the kind of puzzle connect the dots. You're asked to follow the dots in sequence. By connecting the dots, an object is revealed. What connecting the dots did for me was provided a way to help people not familiar with violence prevention think about a bigger picture of what is happening in the lives of those who commit acts of violence. It showed how there are relationships between the different kinds of violence, which gives more options for solutions and prevention. It also showed how individuals and communities are both vulnerable to and protected from exposure to violence, both as victims and as perpetrators. And it did so by revealing the overlapping ways in which different organizations and community partners can work together on the shared risk and protective factors to prevent violence. For me, it was really important as a collaboration tool to help people see how we all have something to contribute to violence prevention. In Ohio, we are using the definition provided from the National Sexual Violence Resource Center as seen on the slide. When I read this definition, I translate risk factors as things that make people more likely to experience or cause violence. Examples of things from connecting the dots include rigid social beliefs about what is masculine and feminine, in economic stress and lack of job opportunities and family conflict. Protective factors make it less likely that a person will experience or cause violence or increase their resilience by acting as a buffer. Examples are connection to a caring adult or having access to mental health services. I think we need to stress that these risk factors are considered contributing factors and not direct causes. 
Not everyone who experiences the risk factors goes on to use violence against other people or experience violence. If you recall, several years ago, ODH collated and ranked all the risk and protective factors RPE funded preventionists were using. A meeting was held to review the results. At this meeting, Ohio preventionists voted to focus on five risk factors and five protective factors. As you can see from the list above, three of the risk factors are about social norms. In episode two, we talked about how in Ohio, we ask that you integrate efforts to impact social norms across all of your programming. So these three social norms, risk factors, should be addressed in each of your PPPs. Social norms and policy change are all key to societal level risk factors, which has the greatest likelihood of creating widespread change. Lack of nonviolent problem solving skills is an individual level risk factor. Our work to build these skills with both youth and in our networks and coalitions contributes towards success in our other areas of work. The five protective factors Ohio prioritized are in this slide. At this time, there are no evidence-based findings on societal level protective factors for sexual violence and research can help fill this gap. Coordination of resources and services among community agencies and community support and connectiveness are community level protective factors. Some of your PPPs will be in support of these protective factors. Our other protective factors are at the relationship level. Building these connections support individuals toward participating in their communities in ways that will support the other changes we are seeking. Yes, you heard me doing my prevention dance about connecting the dots. After the celebration faded, I realized an important risk factor was missing from that chart, oppression. More specifically, oppressions based on one's identity, racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, classism, ableism, and any other forms of oppression. Some risk factors identified in connecting the dots like diminished economic opportunities, high unemployment rates, based on one's identity, this risk factor could increase dramatically depending on historical and or discriminatory practices that impact job opportunities and access to wealth and capital. Access to protective factors can also diminish due to oppressions. For example, LGTBQ youth may not be welcome to after-school activities where they can build connections with caring adults and with pro-social youth. CDC identifies the oppression risk factor as the social determinants of health. Social determinants of health are conditions in which people are born, grow, work, and age. Oppression shapes the distribution of money, power, resources at the state and local level. Oppression can be found in our systems, such as our workplaces, schools, and healthcare facilities. As shown on the slide, across all community systems, resources have been unfairly and unjustly distributed in different communities. One example of health impact of oppression can be seen when looking at health inequities, like maternal mortality and infant mortality, which are much higher for black and brown women. Looking at systems, they reveal historic and current practices for racial discrimination in our country. Negative health outcomes show who has access to clean water, healthy food, parks, local job opportunities, and transportation. Pause the video and answer these questions on your handout. For some of us, the grocery store is nearby or easy to get to, especially if we have a car. The further away and, har and harder it is to get to the supermarket, the harder it is to access affordable and healthy food. Those supermarkets can also be a source of employment, which is harder to access for those farther away and with less reliable transportation. There is a significant gap in access to affordable and healthy food for people living in the urban and predominantly black neighborhoods. From a report conducted for CNN Business 
On average, the 50 largest US metro areas, roughly 17.7% of predominantly black neighborhoods had limited access to supermarkets compared to 7.6 of the largely white neighborhoods. The racial disparity persists across income lines, according to the analysis. That's especially striking that the disparities persist across income lines. I think people often think it has more to do with income than race. Everyone should have access to affordable and healthy food. And there are clearly ways that systemic racism has made existing disparities even worse for black and brown communities. Wow. Can we talk more about how systemic oppression and the social determinants of health connect to ending sexual violence? Yes, the National Sexual Resource Center, or NSVRC, put together an infograph that walks through this conversation. NSVRC helped us out by releasing this infographic in 2019. It lays out risk and protective factors for sexual violence prevention, along with social determinants of health and connects them to ways we can think about our work comprehensively and across the different layers of the social ecological model. I remember when the NSVRC published their social determinants of health document right around the time CDC published connecting the dots. I really wanted to have the two documents crosswalked so we could use both frameworks with our programs. I was really excited when NSVRC released the graphic in the slide so can we look at some of the examples of NSVRC's crosswalk so I can better understand how this chart works? Is this in the handout? Because it's difficult to read on the screen. Yes, Sandra, this infographic is included on the handout for this episode. Earlier, we talked about the value of social norms change to impact the entire community and reminded you that we are asking you to integrate social norms change into all of your activities. In addition to changing norms that are risk factors, norms that support sexual violence and aggression and rigid gender norms, we also ask that you address social norms and attitudes related to oppression, racism, sexism, ableism, and all other related oppressions. As noted by NSVRC, social violence is inextricably tied to oppression and we will not end any form of violence without addressing oppression. In this slide, I pulled out the community row in the NSVRC table to better see how risk and protective factors and social determinant of health play out in the community. Remember, risk factors are those behaviors or things that have been identified as creating potential for sexual violence within a community, whereas protective factors are buffers. We know that the risk and protective factors can affect an entire community. And we also know that social determinants of health or oppression can also affect an entire community. In my example about the grocery store, all communities deserve access to fresh fruit and vegetables in order to be healthy. All communities deserve access to transportation and sidewalks that are accessible for all people. But based on the perception of a neighborhood by businesses and how a city may spend its money, say tax credits or zoning laws, it puts some communities at a disadvantage over others. I really appreciate the work NSVRC did to help us integrate these two frameworks for prevention. It showed that you can't just work on risk and protective factors without working on oppression. If you want to dive deeper into this information, I know that NSBRC's website has an interactive infographic that is pretty cool and guides you through the crosswalk. Plus, they have also created an infographic that walks through oppression. We have included these resources in your handout. Another publication from the treasure trove for us. In 2016, CDC published a strategic vision. The strategic vision encouraged folks who were working on sexual and gender-based violence to connect with other folks who were working on teen dating violence and bullying. The vision emphasized that by using shared risk and protective factors, this could be a cross-cutting way to achieve measurable reduction in sexual violence perpetration and victimization. 
This is especially true by focusing on the same primary population, such as youth. Many of you are already doing this type of work. Sexual violence youth advisory teams are joining with local youth leaders who are working on suicide prevention and drug and alcohol prevention. Two common protective factors these groups are working on are increasing connections with a caring adult and association with pro-social peers. By working together across the shared risk and protective factors for our organizational issues, we are working smarter and we will be more likely to have success. So is this another form of saturation efforts that we talk about, Beth? Let me see if I can explain it, how I understand this to be related to saturation. By focusing efforts to the same population on the same risk and protective factors, even if we're approaching those efforts with a focus on different prevention priorities, the benefits accrue for all of the approved outcomes we're working to achieve. That is definitely a collaborative focus to achieve mutual goals and outcomes through the risk and protective factors that we share. We know that at the local level, resources are being shared like meeting spaces and facilitations of youth leadership teams. Also, some of the alcohol policy and bar work that is going on through partnerships in the communities have multiple partners implementing multiple activities that share outcomes. In addition to the STOP SV technical package, that we are, we're using, CDC has issued other technical packages associated with violence prevention. If you're working with the Children's Trust Fund program in your region, they are working from the ACES technical package and the Preventing Child Abuse and Neglect. Ohio's Delta program has selected their activities from those listed in the Intimate Partner Violence Across the Lifespan technical package. I want to share with you an example of how Ohio is collaborating around these technical packages and the risk and protective factors. As you may be aware, reduction of adverse childhood experiences is a priority for both the state health improvement plan and the work of the maternal and child health block grant, which funds much of ODH's maternal and child health efforts. At the state level, we are working with other ODH injury prevention programs as well as with representatives from the ODH Bureau of Maternal and Child Health and state agencies, including the Departments of Education and Mental Health and Addiction Services and the Children's Trust Fund, as well as the Health Policy Institute of Ohio and the Ohio Suicide Prevention Council to learn about the risk and protective factors each of us is addressing. It is the goal of this effort to align where possible around shared risks as well as ways to increase protective factors, help build resilience, and reduce adverse childhood experiences in Ohio. We've included two case studies showing how other states have collaborated and the results they're achieving, they achieved in the handout. Plus there is a Safe States webinar on how work has been done around ACEs similar to Ohio's current work. After this episode, we suggest you review your program's policies and practices. Using your map, write in the risk and protective factors that are addressed by each program, policy, or practice. Using a highlighter, mark the ones that are from Ohio's priority list. It's okay to address multiple risk and protective factors at once, but focusing on one's prioritized for Ohio's statewide prevention efforts may help you make a decision on which PPP to expand and on work that is prioritized within your efforts. Note where it might make sense to narrow your focus. Think about your community partners doing similar prevention work. Using a different color highlighter, which risk and protective factors do you have in common? If you don't know what your community partners are working on, this would be a good time to have a conversation with them about your related efforts. For this episode, we had three learning objectives. First, we wanted to define and explain the risk and protective factors related to sexual violence prevention from the 2014 CDC publication, Connecting the Dots. We also wanted to include information on the social determinants of health that are frequently used when discussing health disparities.
Secondly, we wanted to identify the risk and protective factors that we all prioritize as those we wanted to focus our efforts on. Remember, Ohio's preventionists prioritized five risk factors and five protective factors to help hone our efforts. By working together on the same risk and protective factors across our programs, we are more likely to see an impact from our collective efforts. And thirdly, we wanted to help you think through how to apply the risk and protective factors in your prevention work and strategize how you can ensure you are addressing the risk and protective factors in your work. A final note about the risk and protective factors, Ohio's prioritized risk and protective factors do not align exactly with the reporting list on the prevention strategy form used for reporting. Refer to the handout for this episode for guidance on how to report these on the prevention strategy form. This slide lists resources we have referenced during this episode. These and additional related resources can be found in the handouts accompanying this episode. Thanks for tuning in to this episode on using continuous quality improvement or CQI process for our prevention work. Remember, we're here to support you. So if you'd like to schedule an individual TA session or just bounce an idea off of us, contact any of us and we're glad to help. A special thank you to Jasmine Barfield for her techie and vlogger expertise, which has helped us to use a different learning platform. We are very grateful. Finally, a program about CQI wouldn't be complete if I didn't ask you to fill out the evaluation following this episode. Your input will help us with the future episodes and identify if we need additional resources. Please join us for our next episode.